Ready to jump into the word this morning? Yeah. yeah. I'm ready. Amen. I think that, I think I, I like the Christmas story, and I'm going to read part of it. Next week, we're going to just primarily read through the Christmas story, but today I want to actually, uh, I want to look at some of the characters in the Christmas story from Matthew. So if you could open your Bible up to, to Matthew chapter one. Have you ever got a gift for Christmas that you really did not, you were not excited about? <laughs> like you open it up and you're like, oh, so underwhelming, such a letdown, so disappointed. And it's not that you're an ungrateful person, but you just opened up this gift and you're like, that was not as advertised. It was a nice box on the outside, good wrapping. I opened it up and it was, what was it? Tell me, what was it? What's something that you got at some point? You could even say as a kid that you were a disappointed. A cheap plastic toy that broke in a week. A cheap plastic toy that breaks in a week. What else? Socks. A Fitbit. That's a good gift. Socks are a good gift too. When you have kids who take your socks every time. You need more socks for Christmas. But anyways, they can be a little disappointing, I guess, especially as a kid. What else? Pajamas. Yeah. Okay, so my son, um, at, we do Christmas, by the way, the right way to do Christmas and Christmas Eve, you, you open the one gift on Christmas Eve and then the rest on Christmas morning. Um, but you can debate over that uh, as much as you'd like. But nevertheless, that's how we do, we do it in our family. So we all grabbed our gifts and each of us had the one. You can't open another one. This is the one you get no matter what it is. And so you open it, and so we all open our gifts, and it's probably, you know, we all got great things that we wanted, and then Justice, he opens his, and it's soap. <laughs> and he was like a 12-year-old kid or 13, you know, and, and um, evidently mom or dad thought it was just so nice and funny to wrap up a gift in, of soap, <laughs> and that's the one he chose. <laughs> And he was so let down. <laughs> he was so disappointed in his Christmas gift. Like, that's it, buddy. That's the one you get. And mom, you know, her heart's breaking. Like, oh, we got to get him. Let him open another one. And I'm like, nope. <laughs> it's the rules. It's the rules. <laughs> so I want to talk about the Christmas gift that God's given us and people's reaction and response to that from Matthew chapter 1. And we're going to look at four different uh, people, persons, people. And uh, I just, I think that when we read this, you're going to see some of yourself in this group, these people. And it's not so much of if, it's, it's how much of, right? How much of yourself do you see in this? And some of them you're going to be like, I hope I don't see any of myself in that. And other times you're like, I'm kind of, I wish I didn't, but I do. And then some you're like, yeah, and I want to be right there. So and in Matthew chapter 1. It says, and starting in verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother, Mary, was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Okay, so the first person in, in the Christmas story that we want to talk about is Joseph. Joseph was a just man. He was a good man. He was, he's a righteous man. He's a solid guy. He's that kind of guy that you like, integrity, character, moral values, just a solid person. The person you want on your team, you want in your neighborhood, you're calling this guy for help. He's just a good guy. Good all around godly man. He's just, he's a good guy. And he's engaged, they use the word betrothed, which is like marriage, it's, but it's not fully marriage um, because they've not yet been together yet. That's when the marriage actually happens. It's more than being engaged. It's in order to break it off, you don't say like, hey, maybe we shouldn't do this. It is equivalent of divorce to break off a of betrothal. So this is where they are in their commitment to one another. It's a public, uh, public commitment. You know, the whole community knows about it. And she's pregnant. <laughs> and it's not Joseph's baby. Now, we've got all kinds of um, issues that arise out of that, right? I mean, this is, this is the Christmas story. By the way, I love how the Bible stories are not always clean. They're not always, and I don't just mean like clean, like 
uh, NC-17, or you know, are, there are some of those in the Bible, by the way. But I mean, it's like it, it's messy. The Bible stories are messy. We want to have, in fact, the Bible laws are not messy. They're very clean, clear. Like this is right, that's wrong, and every time, and you know, the rules like that. But yet, the living it out is messy. Even at the very first Christmas, the birth of Christ, the whole story is kind of messy. In your life, the story of God showing up is probably pretty messy too, isn't it? When you look at it and you think, nah, you know what? Things were not all above board all the time, were they? Even you think, think back to the early days of, you know, being a Christian and yet not yet being very sanctified. Some of you are like, the early days, that's like yesterday. No, you know, like I got saved when I was 17 and the culture I was saved out of, you know, it's just like, just because you got saved doesn't mean that my mind is renewed yet. And I look back and I'm embarrassed when I talk with my friends about what we did and how we acted and so forth. But we love Jesus. He showed up in the midst of that. God's faithful. He'll, he'll finish the work he started in you. Let me just say that. But he shows up and, and, and here's the deal. God made this mess. This isn't Joseph and Mary's mess. This is God's mess he made. Think about that. Like these guys were good. Like this sweet couple. They're going to get married. It's going to be awesome. And God comes in and he just makes a mess of it all. <laughs> There's no indication they were asking for this. This is Joseph and Mary. They're going about their own business, being good, decent, God-fearing people. And God messes things up in their life in a major way. When he shows up, he has a tendency to do that to us, to mess things up, to put us in some awkward situations to where we need to make some hard decisions that other people won't understand, and we might not either. And so here we are, Joseph is betrothed to Mary, and she's found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. He had not yet known her in the biblical sense. And the Bible says this, he's a just man and being a just man, not wanting to make her a public example, meaning this, if he breaks this off and he's like, she's pregnant, because this is what he's going to do. He says, I am minded to put her away secretly. And I, I love the language. He's minded to put her away secretly. It's sort of like he's, he's part of the Jewish mafia or something like, hey, we're going to put her away secretly. <laughs> Nobody's going to know what happened to her. <laughs> I don't think that's what it meant. I think it meant to, to, to divorce her and, and like, hey, we're just gonna do this on the down low or maybe we'll just go our separate ways. And it'll be like, what happened? I don't know. You know, like, this is what he's thinking. Like, how do we get out of this here secretly? But while he thought about these things, verse 20, it says, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Now catch this here. The angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream. A lot of times when you hear, you know, you read the story, when I read it, I've always thought just an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph and said, and the Bible doesn't say the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, it appeared to him in a dream. Okay, and then listen to what the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said in the dream. It appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you, Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife. Okay, think about this. This is heavy on his mind, isn't it? I mean, this is all he's thinking about. He's thinking about it so much that he falls asleep thinking about it. And he has a dream. And the angel comes and clears things up for him in this dream. Oh yeah, don't worry about it, Joseph, because Though your wife is pregnant, it's actually of the Holy Spirit. And that baby that she's pregnant with is actually the Son of God. 
And, and that son of God, you're going to name him Jesus because he's going to save his people from their sins. Does that sound like a pizza dream? Or does you're saying, no, I think it is. I think that the angel of the Lord is telling him, if you if you catch this, how 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 much of a step of faith it is. You know, it's not a pizza dream. We know it's the angel of the Lord. But think about this. The angel of the Lord did not simply appear to Joseph like while he's lucid and awake, but he has this crazy dream that explains everything. Do you ever have some crazy dreams? And this is not, this one doesn't make sense to him. Us, we look back and we understand the whole story, but just think about the context. Here's a just man who, who's looking at the situation. He doesn't understand what's happening. He's probably embarrassed. He's ashamed. He's at risk of losing his reputation. He's concerned of what will happen to Mary, whom he loves. And he has a dream and the Lord speaks to him through it, through an angel. And he, the angel proclaims the gospel to Joseph in the dream. She, this virgin will have a child named Jesus. He's the savior of, of, of his people from all their sins. Joseph has to take that gospel message that he heard by faith and act upon it. This year, Joseph is one of the first people in this Christmas story to hear the gospel message proclaimed. Amen. And it's proclaimed to him in a dream. And he gets to be like front row to this whole thing. Yep. Not so exciting though for him. Uh -huh. Joseph had to receive Christ by faith and then act upon the instruction that was given. And so what does the Bible say about Joseph? Well, it goes on, Joseph being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn child and he called his name Jesus. So he heard this gospel message in a dream. And uh, do you think that waking from that dream, he probably had to wrestle through at times questioning, now was this me or was that the Lord? Was this me or is it true? I think he probably did have to wrestle with those things. I think that because we wrestle with those things. Is this just me or is this true? Is that are there multiple gods or is there one God? Are there multiple ways or is there one way? Is that, you know, we wrestle through those things in our minds, but we have to come back to but it's I believe it's true. And so I'm going to act on it. I'm going to hold it by faith. Joseph, he's a just man. He probably didn't understand some things that sounded weird, but he had to embrace them by faith. Have you ever not understood some things, the things of God, and yet had to embrace them by faith? Absolutely. Salvation itself. There are times where, you know, there are a lot of things in Scripture. I don't, I don't truly completely understand that. But I embrace it. I don't comprehend it, but I apprehend it, right? I don't understand it all, but I, I grab hold of it because I believe God's word is true. I believe he knows more than me. I believe that at the end of the day, he's going to be right. I believe that. So I want to align myself and my faith with it. That's the kind of man that Joseph was. He was a just man and he had to take things by faith. After this, by the way, we don't really hear much about Joseph. Joseph kind of like, Rides off into the sunset, cowboy. Like, this is what he does. He plays his part in the story, and he gets out of the limelight really quick. But what's really interesting is that Joseph didn't, he, he didn't um, miss out on the gospel. He had the gospel from the very beginning. He was able to receive the gospel from the very beginning. Something about, you know, Joseph, I don't really haven't often thought about until I'm just looking at this and thinking, man, you got it before anybody else. You got it before anybody else. You, uh, you got the gospel. Second person I want to talk about, let's go into chapter two. 
Herod, King Herod. Now, start, starting in verse 1 through 3. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the east, from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king, now remember, the wise men came and said, Where is the king who was born? But now it says, And Herod the king. When Herod the king heard these things, heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Okay, so wise men, we'll get to them in just a few moments, but uh, wise men, this probably a large group of people came traveling from the Far East, and they make their way into town, and wise men is, you know, the old way of translating that would be wizards. These guys are astrologers, not like modern day astrology in your newspaper, but they would be people who study the stars and as part of their religious practice, they would not be people who follow uh, the you know Old Testament law and worship God in the same way as the rest of the Jewish people. They're from the Far East. And here they come into town and they probably look a lot different. They're dressed a lot different. You know, they've got their camels, they've got the, all, all kinds of cargo. They're bringing their, you know, their, their suitcases with them and their treasures with them. And these guys come into town and it's like Gandalf coming into town. And like everybody's looking thinking, oh, who is this? They carry themselves with an authority and there's something about their presence. And, and they start saying, where's the king that was just born? And not only was Herod, the sitting king, concerned, but the whole city of Jerusalem was troubled. Now, what's interesting about this is Herod's response to Christmas, right? The Christmas story about the king coming, where Joseph was kind of lacking understanding, but yet embraced by faith. Herod was deeply troubled by this. Why is that? Because there's a new king in town, right? And Herod, he's not even really a king anyways. And he didn't understand that. There was Caesar Augustus, the emperor, who had appointed Herod as the governor over uh, Jerusalem and, and the surrounding area, Judea. So he positioned himself like a king, and he finds out that the king of kings is showing up into town, and he doesn't want to give up his power and control. He likes sitting on the throne and having that authority and control and power in his own life. And when Jesus shows up on the scene, he doesn't like it. He's threatened by it. He's intimidated by it. And instead of recognizing, oh, there's a king, I need to step off this throne and allow him his rightful place, what's he do? Well, we know the story. He gets the wise men to tell him when and where, or he gets the, the priests to tell him where the king would be born, and the wise men to tell, uh, tell him where he found it. Them, so he would go around behind them and kill all the children so that he could ultimately kill the king. Herod um, knew that you can't have two kings. And Herod wasn't willing to give up the power and control. I think about this, John the Baptist. What did he do when Jesus shows up? He said, he must increase and I must decrease. This should have been Herod's response at the time, but Herod was a proud man. I wonder in our own lives sometimes when I read the story of Herod, man, am I on the throne and unwilling to give Jesus his rightful spot? Do I like to be in control of my own life? Do I like to have my own power? Do I want things done my own way? Or am I willing to allow him to sit on the throne and be in control? Sometimes we say God is in control, well, if God is in control, why are you making all the decisions? Why are you making decisions that are, are opposite of what he says? If God is in control. No, if God is in control, let him lead. Let him guide. Trust him, even if it doesn't make sense. Even if it threatens your popularity. Even if you don't get to have final say. You look at Herod and you think, oh man, I don't want to be like that. But there are times in my life, if we're a little bit honest, do you ever have a hard time giving up control? Or maybe let, we could be more honest. Does the person next to you ever have a hard time <laughs> giving up control, releasing control? 
Herod, um, Herod didn't recognize that he was, he was just the steward, not the owner. Right? We talked about this a couple weeks ago about stewardship versus ownership. Herod was a steward. He wasn't the owner, but yet he acted like the owner. And so as a result, he resisted and rejected Christ. The next group of people. So when he had, he had gathered, verse 4, when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. So Herod, he's troubled by this, and he gets the scribes, the, the high priest, the chief priests together, those who know the most, the ones who are in charge of the religion here. And he says, what does the Bible say about where the Christ will be born, where the king is going to be born? And they say this little, you know, podunk town called Bethlehem over here. That's where he's going to be born. Now, all these guys knew that these magi, these wise arts, these wizards came in and they said the king has been born, the Messiah. This is who they're talking about. They then go to the scripture and say, yeah, scripture tells us where he's going to be born. And you know what the Bible said that they do about it? That the chief priests and the scribes, what, what do they do when they realize, oh, the king has been born and he's been born in this town? You know what it says they do? Nothing. It doesn't say anything about what they do. They do nothing about this. Their whole life has been based on, you know, their role, their assignment is, I represent God to the people, the people to God. You know, we're priests, we're mediators, we, we minister to people, we minister from this word here, and we know what it says, and we are anticipating God coming back. We anticipate the Messiah showing up and saving his people. And here they are, and they hear about it, they know where it's at, and they do nothing. They do nothing. You know what this tells me about these guys? They respond with apathy. Joseph responded with maybe a fear and a mi misunderstanding. Herod responded out of, oh, great anxiety that he's going to lose control. These guys, they respond to the Christmas message with, hmm, so what's for lunch? Like, the Messiah is born. They know where and they know about when. And this is their whole life that they've been waiting for. And they don't say, guys, pack up. We're going to Bethlehem. Yeah. We're going to go see this king. We're going to drop everything right now and go see this king. We're going to find him. We're going to welcome him. We're going to celebrate him. We're going to check him out. We're going to confirm it. We're going to make sure it's true, whatever it is. They don't do any of that. They just simply say, hmm, there you go. And nothing. I think about this in my life, and, and maybe maybe you could, would think about it. Here's how often have you heard the truth, known the truth, believed the truth, but not responded to the truth? You think about some of these things. This is why in, in church, by the way, I am I am uh, I am convinced that man, we could hear the messages, great messages over and over, great teaching over and over, but until we actually get some conversation about what are you going to do about it, and have somebody in your life who, who challenges you and you challenge them to do something about it, I feel like we can end up like the scribes and, and these chief priests. Yep. We know so much. We can know so much. We can have a Bible quiz right now. And I'm telling you, man, we got some competitors. <laughs> and yet, it's not the knowing. It's the application. It's, it's pursuing him. It's acting on the word, the truth. What his instruction, his, his, his sayings. And so I don't want to be like Herod. I definitely don't want to be the bad guy. I don't want to be like these chief priests who I know a lot, but I don't do anything about it. It doesn't change my life. I don't want to be like that. I kind of want to be more like the wise men here, the magi. So let's look at them here. And, and again, chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, and I'll just reread that part. Uh, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the east. They... they 
from the east and came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. So some say it may have taken uh, up to two years for them to travel. I don't know how far east they came. Um, we, by the way, theologically, when we look at our major scene, we have like, oh, there's, there's our magi there. Do we have shepherds over there? Not really. Uh, the magi should have been like over there somewhere on Christmas morning. They should be on their way, right? Because they're not there on Christmas morning. They show up, and this is where we see this. When they go and find him, Herod said, go find him. Verse 9, it says, when they, depart, when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them until it came and stood over where the young child was. Okay, so not baby Jesus, but young child Jesus. So this is where he's probably, you know, he's probably uh, under two years old um, at this time. So th they show up a little bit late to the Christmas story. They're like on... The second Christmas or third Christmas. That's, that's when they get there. Just in case you're wondering, as Pastor Daniel knows, timeline, barely. Nevertheless, they're traveling. Why would they see a star in the east and think, I need to go and, and, and find the king? Because these guys were influenced by Daniel in the Old Testament. His, his ministry, when he, he and Shadrach, Meshach, and a bungalow were carried off into Babylon, and they were... Daniel was the chief over all the rabbi, uh, all the wise men, the magi. And so he trained these guys who would have been idolaters, they'd have been astrologers, but he also trained them in the ways of the word of God. And to where they would understand his prophecy about the coming of the king, some would say almost to the day, definitely within the year. Uh, when you read the book of Daniel, and he talks about seven sevens and the coming of the king, that these guys were waiting in expectation for that time to be fulfilled. So they were influenced by Daniel the prophet from years ago, and they were waiting for this Messiah, this promised king that he had spoken about. And so they were looking in the, in the heavens and everything else to tell him when the time to go is. And so that's why they showed up, because they knew eventually the king of kings would appear, and they came to worship him. And so they came from a, a long distance and they brought their treasure and they came to verse 10. It says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy, exceedingly great joy. There is an expectation and an understanding that this is leading us to the truth, to the one, to our salvation, to our hope, to the fulfillment of everything that that we were created for right here. They show up at the place and their response for Christmas the gift that God has for them, the Christ, is exceedingly great joy. They weren't fearful. They weren't tr deeply troubled. They weren't um, apathetic, but they were full of joy and expectation when they showed up here. And it says in verse 11, And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him gold, frankincense, and myrrh, then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. So we see these magi here, and uh, man, these guys, great joy, full of great joy. Think about this. Does, does the whole idea of Christmas cause you great joy? Now, I know people have experienced pain around it. They, they think about the loss of relationships sometimes or even loved ones and it's a meaningful time christmas is a meaningful time but yet when our focus if we can take that and say okay but even in the midst of that i know what it's about and i know that it's about god showing up and bringing his gift of salvation to me and so while there is heartache and heartbreak around in other areas i can still receive joy because of who jesus is and what he's done there's something about that. These guys, these guys responded with a great joy. And what did they do? They came to worship. They, they worshiped. They, they humbled themselves before the Lord. They bowed before him. And they began to, to worship him and put him in his proper place on the throne of their own hearts right there, right? They were enthroning God in, with praise. They were worshiping him. And they brought their gifts, their treasures to him. By the way, very impractical gifts for a, a young family, right? 
hey, here's a bunch of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I mean, gold's nice, I guess, and maybe the ointments, and they all have um, significant prophetic meanings to them. Actually, I guess if you were about to travel, flee to Egypt, gold really came in handy. God provided for them. But nevertheless, they brought their best. They brought their best. And I look at this with the wise men. I think, okay, out of all the characters in here, I kind of want to be like Joseph part two, right? Not part one, where I'm going to put her away secretly. <laughs> like, we're going to have to put some people away secretly here. There's some people that you won't see in church next week. You wonder what happened to them. They got put away secretly. <laughs> don't ask about it. You know, so we'll have to put you away secretly too. I don't want to be part one. I want to be part two where like, okay, I'm going to do what the Lord said. Right? I had a dream. I had a dream. I don't want to be like Herod. I don't want to be like the, the uh, chief priests. But I do want to be like these guys who, who go as far as I need to go. That's what a qu question you got to ask yourself. How far are you willing to go for Jesus? How far are you willing to go? How committed are you willing to be? How, how are you willing? What are you willing to give up? in order to lay hold of, right? How far are you willing to go? What are you willing to give? These guys brought their best. They went as far as it took. They paid the price. They gave their best. What are you willing to give them? Man, my all, my first, my best, my everything, my heart, my faith, my trust. That's what I'm willing to give them. So th this is what I want us to do. I want us to take a moment to respond because I believe this here. I believe that um, we're in this story too. Somewhere, somehow, we're in this story too. And the main point though is not, by the way, the main character in here, it's not any of those four. The main character is Christ. The, main, the, the, the star of the show, it's not the star in heaven, it, it, it's, it's Jesus. And so this is where I say we're in this story because it says he'll save his people from their sins. Like this is his gift. to He is the gift to all of us. Yeah. But how do we respond and, and receive it? So can we just take a moment before we break into our groups? And I, wanna, I want us to pray. And uh, let, let's bring our hearts to God and, and um, invite him to speak to us even right now. Lord Jesus, we bow our heads, we close our eyes, Lord God, and we set our minds on you. Jesus, thank you that you are the gift of God to us, the gift of salvation, the gift of freedom, the gift that brings great joy. Lord, we choose to worship you. We choose to come to you, Lord God, and to trust you by faith, who you are and what you said you do. And Lord God, our hearts are, are both to respond and worship but also with action, God, following you all the days of our life. Lord Jesus, I thank you that there's, though there's been times where we've resisted, where we've wanted to hold on to control, uh, where we've even responded with apathy, there's mercy and forgiveness. So Lord God, would you forgive us for, for any of that response in our heart like that? And Lord, help us to be people like Joseph who hear your word and act on it. People like the, the wise men who, who seek you out and pursue you until we find you. In your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, this is what I want us to do. I want us to take some, some time to actually talk about this a little bit. Got a couple questions on the screen. A really important one to get us started. Christmas gifts. Christmas Eve or Christmas morning. It's up to you. you. You can choose at your table. But nevertheless, quick question number two. Who do you think you would respond like if you were in this story? And why is that? And then the second one, uh, third one is, how, have you ever hesitated to give up control in your, of your life to Jesus? And this doesn't have to be the beginning. It'll be various times, but when? Let's talk about some of these things and how you see, how you relate to it. So uh, break up into your, your circles there. Talk if you're in a row and you need to move your chairs go ahead we'll take about 10 minutes and then we'll come back together for some refreshments i'll wrap us up hey i'm glad to hear that there's a lot of people who open the gifts on christmas day and uh some of you do it at midnight i heard so that you can do both that's cheating i think that's like riding the fence um you're gonna get splinters nevertheless hey 
keep your conversation going. A good, good connection time there. I love to hear the, what's happening at the tables. And uh, we've got refreshments for you that you've already made your way for, some of you guys, but it's at the table. Thank you to our hospitality team. You guys are amazing. We love you guys. Invite somebody to church with you, 4 o'clock on Saturday. Uh, we love you. Have a great week. Merry Christmas. Look forward to seeing you then.